Well, welcome everyone. So let me just introduce myself. I'm Jennifer Walsh. I'm a political scientist who, who has studied in the past state and local politics. I'm also now Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. Uh, but one of the things I started doing when I joined APU is doing an overview of ballot propositions First for my students, when I used to teach state and local politics uh, in the faculty side, I had students often asking questions. They were new time voters. What do I do with this? How do I decide? And uh, I just started doing a basic overview, nonpartisan, basic uh, debrief, and that really became helpful. And so I started inviting the campus community, and all of a sudden, uh, it especially last year, we had something like 20 different propositions on the ballot, it became its own thing. Um, so by uh, people started asking back in September, when are you gonna do the election overview? Um, and so here we are. So thanks for coming and, and joining us today. There aren't as many uh, propositions on this year's ballot and they're not as sexy, I'll just be honest. I was looking at it kind of going, that's kind of dry, boring, run-of-the-mill stuff. Nevertheless, it's very important. So I'm glad that you're here, many of you with notepads taking notes. Um, and let me just start out by saying uh, I completely uh, approach this from a nonpartisan position. I'm happy to help identify where parties sometimes align on these things, if that helps to give you some cues. Uh, but to represent my complete nonpartisan status, I'm wearing both red and blue today. So I am not taking any sides whatsoever. And you can try to discern where I fall on these issues, but I'm not going to give any clues away. So that will be your sleuthing uh, job for the night. All right, just a couple of quick things before we dive in. If you have yet to register to vote, there's still time. So we have until October 22nd to register to vote. It may be helpful for you just to double check your registration. You can do that easily now online. Uh, you can go to the Secretary of State website. I think registertovote.ca.gov is probably the easiest place to start. You can register there or check your registration. Sometimes if you've moved, you don't realize you've moved uh, or you're somehow not in the system the way you should be, you don't want to have any surprises on election day. Just as a kind of a point though, if you do ever show up at the poll and you're not on the list, you can ask for a provisional ballot and they will manually um, check that to make sure that you are properly uh, a resident of the state. So you might have to show some ID or some additional information, but you can get a provisional ballot. Election day, of course, is Tuesday, November 6th, and I know there's great interest in making that a, a, a holiday. Uh, as far as I know, there has been no decision to close APU, so you can run out and vote that day. Um, but I understand there may be some decision makers listening to this uh, feed at some point, and that may be a, a gem for the future, but I don't think that's going to happen this year. This is really s tiny, and when you'll see this on the feed, if you want, you can blow this up. But just to give you an overview of where the state spends its money, since many of the propositions we'll be looking at tonight focus on money. And so I thought it would be helpful to know where our money goes. Um, the biggest expenditure is K-12 through education. So those of you who work with the public school system or are a member of our school of education or somehow involved with public schools, this is not a surprise and it should be a bit of a relief to you because there's always a concern about about state funding. Um, back in the late 1980s, we passed a voter initiative that guaranteed a certain percentage of funding for K through 12 education so there wouldn't be any fiscal surprises and that we could guarantee that certain levels would be maintained over the years. So in case you can't read that very small print, we spend about uh, $55 uh, billion dollars on, on education, uh, 55.9, and therefore there's a lot of money to be had in that particular sector. The second largest is Health and Human Services. Uh, that's coming in at $39.48 billion. And then you split up uh, some criminal justice efforts, higher education at the state school systems, um, government operations, they all come in a distant fourth, fifth, and sixth place. In terms of revenue, shouldn't be a huge surprise to know that you are the source of California revenue, right? The vast majority of our state money comes from personal income tax to the tune of $95 billion, that's billion with the B, um, followed closely by s sales and use tax, that's another 20 some billion dollars, $27 billion. The reason why that's significant, we're talking a little bit about land use and homeowner uh, related concerns, and I'll, I'll dive down a little bit deeper into how our uh, tax incentives work in order to spur on both personal and corporate investments in the state of California. There's also um, some insurance monies that we collect, 
Of course, now there's an alcohol beverage tax and I think marijuana tax to be assessed soon. Uh, I don't know how much revenue that's gonna bring, but uh, that's, that was a big selling point last time we did this. And then of course, motor vehicle fees and a few other miscellaneous fees that come in. Since a number of our propositions have to do with bond debt, I thought it was helpful to show this slide. This is embedded in the back of your voter information guide, so I don't claim any uh, proprietary ownership on this particular graphic. I did add the pieces in tan, though, just to give you some context. So the, the place in, that's shaded in black on the top part of the right-hand side of the screen, that's the proposed additional bond debt that is represented on this year's ballot initiative. So if we were to approve everything as voters, it would represent an additional $14.4 billion in bond debt that would be paid out over a period of time, uh, somewhere between 35 and 40 years. It will be added, though, to the cumulative bond debt that has been growing over the past several decades. Um, so you can see from the light grade shade area, these are bonds are already sold, and that represents about $74 billion. Our annual um, payments on that bond debt represents about $6 billion a year. And again, remember the overall total revenue that comes in is about $160 billion. So it's a small percentage, but not trivial number. Um, and then there's a number of bonds that we have authorized the state to sell as voters through previous elections, but the state hasn't actually done that. And there's a bond market that they take into consideration. And if you really are interested in this, you can go to the Department of Finance site and see when the next bond sale is. They have a calendar and a whole process for that. So if you want to be a shareholder in the state's debt, you are more than welcome to do that. We actually have a decent bond rating these days. It wasn't always that case. Um, but our revenues have been healthy. We've been able to pay our bond debt down in a steady fashion. And so our bond ratings are pretty strong at the moment. Um, you can see that if we approve um, uh, all of the bond debt, the, the, obviously the annual payments are going to go up. And I didn't put this on the slide, but it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 9 to $12 billion a year if everything that has been authorized, including the things on this particular election, are approved by voters, it would um, it greatly enhance how much annual payments we'd be making. So probably closer to nine and a half, ten billion $10 billion. Um, but depending on what we add in the future, of course, can go up from there. Okay, so the first one is a bond initiative. So Prop 1 is a housing bond. It has a number of different purposes there. I've broken it down. Again, if you want to study this, it's a, a consolidation of things that are represented in various parts of your voter guide. And I should say for this one slide, or this first introductory slide for each proposition, I've tried to rely on both the California Secretary of State information as well as the Legislative Analyst Office. So there's nothing there that is um, additional in terms of information. It's just a consolidation and summary. On the second slide, which we'll get to viewpoints both opposing and in favor, um, I've compiled a variety of different sources because sometimes what's printed in your official summary guide is really a representation of interest groups and not necessarily a true um, comprehensive overview of how people are thinking about this initiative. In this case, we're looking at a statute and you'll see there are a couple of propositions on the ballot that are also constant constitutional amendments, and there's really not a huge significance between the two because voters have the options of enacting both. Um, there's two things just to keep in mind. It takes more signatures to qualify something to become part of the Constitution at the state level. It's an 8% of, uh, of the last gubernatorial election that we have to collect in order to qualify something for the, the, um, the ballot. And it's also harder to change. So if it goes into the Constitution, as you might imagine, it's not as flexible. You have to go back to the voters with a new constitutional amendment in order to get it changed. So there's a permanent see there that I think uh, is appropriate given that we're talking about amending the state constitution. For most of these though what we're talking about are just regular old laws that you and I get to vote on and they can be changed either through sometimes subsequent legislative action or often in the form of another ballot initiative somewhere down the line. All right so this one has four billion dollars in authorized debt only three of which really would add to our total debt burden. And that's because the housing assistance program, the last billion dollars identified for veterans, is a self-funded program. So this allows veterans to have 
uh, some home homeowner assistance and, and providing that down payment and also carrying the mortgage. But of course, as they're paying back their own mortgage, that money's returned to the state. So it's not unlike our student loan program where we direct lend to borrowers, but then over time that's directly paid back to the source of the loan. So it's not counted as part of the debt burden that I showed you just a minute ago. It's not included in that 14.4 billion because it would be self-funding and therefore not covered by taxpayers directly. Um, there's always the potential of default, but overall we've done this type of program a number of times, especially with veterans and special populations, and we've never had a problem with that repayment coming through on a, on a, a global level. The three billion though that is earmarked for general obligation bonds, which means that you and I as taxpayers would be contributing to the financing of these initiatives, would mostly go to affordable housing. So as you know, California faces a housing crunch. We don't have enough housing for the demand that exists in our state. I think the last time I checked, we have about 300, uh, we have 300 new home con uh, homes constructed for every thousand people that want one. So there's a perpetual shortage, especially around the affordable price range. And as you know, with the shortage market demand, that always puts upward pressure on prices. And therefore, people who have median incomes, which are the most inflexible, at least in this last economic recession, we're just not seeing low and median incomes keep up as much as the upper level incomes. It's becoming, uh, obviously, an increasing problem. So many are citing this as a reason for our growing homelessness population, is that people simply can't afford to live here the way they may have in the past even few years. So this would designate a number of uh, dollars for different programs, most of which would be for affordable or low-income housing. Some are targeting multifamily um, housing units. This is your typical apartment or condominium complex. Some would be for high-density urban areas near public transportation hubs. This could have a revitalizing effect. So if you have a housing project next to the Gold Line, for example, this could attract people who are using mass transit and therefore help to revitalize some of those areas. It's not just a matter of cost of housing, though, the house itself. We know that the more people that move into an area is going to put pressure on sewage lines and water demands and traffic mitigation. So you know, and as soon as a new housing complex opens, that means immediately you've got traffic concerns, there's pressure on uh, infrastructure, city services become tapped, and therefore this would help to compensate that. In the end, what this initiative, I think, is trying to do is incentivize construction, uh, especially when there's not as much profit margin to be had. As you can imagine, if you're a developer and you have the option of building a luxury housing that can command a premium price or affordable housing for low and mid-income families, uh, you're going to go with the one that gives you the greatest profit margin. So if there's some uh, incentive that the state can offer to help expand uh, the range of housing options, that's what uh, is always uh, at stake. And so this proposition is, I think, an attempt to do that. All right, viewpoints for and against. Um, so as I mentioned, this is uh, viewed as an attempt to help the housing shortage, and it will particularly aid those who are struggling to keep up with the rising cost of housing. Um, there's concern that we are, I think 25% of our nation's veterans are homeless in California. So the Veterans Home Assistance Program is a way to help mitigate that. Um, federal funds do exist for states that have adopted low and middle income housing uh, projects and so this would allow us to bring in two billion dollars of federal do uh, revenue to help offset some of the cost of the state um, and uh, people who are normally sensitive to taking on more debt have indicated that the overall benefit uh, seems to be worth the uh, the small impact that this would have on our overall accumulated debt and our debt service ratio um, but then you have on the opposite side a concern about the growing amount of debt. And while it's not as big as it's been in the past, adding more at a time when uh, Governor Brown just projected that he thinks the next recession might be around the corner, there's always a hesitancy to take on more debt that, of course, we'll be paying off for the next 35 years. 
So we might not be here to enjoy uh, the fruit of that, but our kids will be inheriting that, and that's always a consideration for people who worry about public financing. Um, and then uh, there's consideration about this is really a Band-Aid solution. It doesn't really address the core uh, reason for housing crisis. And I'll, I'll get into it a little bit later on, but it's we don't incentivize single family and multifamily housing construction that we did perhaps in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And some of that has to do with um, the, the changes in property tax law and how it now incentivizes retail developments rather than home construction. So there's not a whole lot of activity on the no side. Um, there weren't any uh, major oppositions recorded either in the official um, summary as well as in with the, among interest groups, but nevertheless, they're out there and you should be aware of them. Okay, in the guide it says for pro, so it doesn't raise taxes. Is that true? Um, it will because three billion will be covered by general taxpayer um, uh, funds. We have to pay off that debt, but the impact overall is is estimated to be pretty minimal. So, um, I guess the question is, do we have sufficient income already to pay it off, or will we have to look at it, raise taxes? Right now, the state is healthy. We have more income than we can spend. So Brown has just deferred a bunch into a rainy day fund because we don't need to spend it all. So at the present, we don't have to worry about income taxes going up or sales taxes going up to cover this particular bond. If the economy has a downturn though, we still owe payments on that bond amount, just like a credit card bill. So if incomes are high, then that minimum payment doesn't become a real source of problem. If uh, income goes away though, or, or something like that, then we may have to look at tax hikes in order to, but there's no, the, the, um, the official position is that there's no need right now to uh, raise taxes to cover the payments. Is there any um, idea of where this money might be spent um, in terms of the housing, the low cost housing and all that kind of stuff? Have they got that worked out or? Yes, there are a number of agencies, both at the county as well as state level that would be in charge of administering these funds. Often it does, there's specific line items in terms of which agency is getting what pot yeah. of money, um, but there's like the homeowner assistance programs, there's a dedicated process already established. There's nothing new administratively that would be created to implement this particular measure. Um, Prop 2 is another bond issue. This one's slightly different. Uh, this is actually uh, a two-part um, proposition. So the first part actually happened by legislative statute back in 2016. So the state government passed a law called No Place Like Home, and it authorized the um, construction of housing for the seriously mentally ill. Uh, which is another source of our homeless population. We have people on the streets that are incapable of holding down jobs. They have strained or severed ties with family members. Uh, they might be addicted to substances, which makes uh, sufficiency in a kind of a traditional job difficult or impossible. And they often end up on the streets as a result. And then of course, with mentally ill people, um, there may be a, a public safety component that needs to be addressed in addition to uh, just the general human suffering associated with homelessness. So in 2016, the state legislature passed this bill, but it didn't articulate any funding for this housing construction. This is the funding piece. Uh, so what it basically says is that um, we will issue bonds to construct housing for the seriously mentally ill, but the payments won't come from taxpayers. It will come from other funds already in place to service the mentally ill population. Those are found right now at the county level. So California has 58 counties and, and they have various degrees of complexity and wealth, but each of them have access to a fund for mental health services. And it's in the neighborhood of $140 million a year that this would authorize the transfer of those funds at the county level back to repay these bonds. Um, so for those of you who are concerned about taking on additional taxpayer debt, uh, this would not be a source of that. Now, uh, we'll get into the pros and cons later. The funding does come from somewhere, and it's probably just another form of taxpayer dollars. It's just already identified, and it wouldn't be new monies coming out. Um, there's a, a competitive grant process that would be used to award these funds, so not every single county would get them. Uh, interestingly enough, because it, it applies to our area, uh, uh, Claremont, Pomona, and Laverne are considered a county for the purpose of this grant program. 
uh, part of it is just the LA County is so huge and you have East Los Angeles County and West Los Angeles County and the East Los Angeles County areas have a particular uh, growing homelessness population that I think uh, whoever was sponsoring this bill probably was attentive to and sensitive about. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the smaller counties would go through a competitive grant process. There would be an automatic allocation for the larger counties under the, the assumption that they have already a substantial homeless burden that's demonstrated through evidence. Um, one final piece that's important, it's kind of buried in the voter guide, is that uh, all of this is on hold until a superior court challenge can be worked out. Uh, there's uh, some question about whether or not um, the voters should have approved the 2016 measure in the first place, not just this piece. There was a challenge that was presented about a year and a half ago, which is partly why there's been a, a lag in time between the 2016 bill that the legislature passed and this particular initiative. Right now, I went to check yesterday, it's still pending the last major action in the Sacramento Superior Court was last April. So apparently there's no urgency around a decision. This has been in the system for over a year. So it's very possible that voters will approve this and nothing will happen until um, there's some clarity around that it's going to be continued on hold. Uh, so that is a footnote that is perhaps important here. In terms of pros and cons, um, again, we're talking about housing and homelessness. So for those who are concerned about that particular uh, area of, of uh, social need, uh, we'll, we'll see that these arguments address that. Uh, the bonds, again, will come out of existing county funds, which are taxpayer supplied, so there is an indirect taxpayer implication, uh, but it's not a direct um, funding mechanism. And there will be opportunity for counties to uh, provide evidence of how these funds would be used in a constructive fashion. So this is not a blank check. If you look at the requirements needed to submit a grant, they have to demonstrate um, a collaboration between the public safety divisions within the county, as well as the health and human services division. Public health is obviously a growing concern that we've had various epidemic outbreaks among our homeless populations. So they're a part of the competitive grant process as well. So in, in the process of planning, uh, there will be some active collaboration and evidence brought in to bear. Um, again, on, this, on the opposition side, you see people concerned about taking on additional public funding. Uh, however, as I pointed out, there was only one no vote in both the Assembly and State Senate. There seems to be no organized opposition to this. Uh, there seems to be a widespread um, support across political parties. And if that matters to you, you can um, take some comfort in knowing that there's a unanimity about this particular initiative. No, it's all California counties, yes. So the question was, is it just LA County? No, it's all California counties. Would be eligible to at least apply. So do they take into account or require services other than the housing? I can't imagine dealing with the mentally ill without a comprehensive program that deals with social services, mental health treatments, all the rest. Exactly. So as part of that grant process, they have to demonstrate that all of these services will be provided and uh, working together to address a particular need. Uh, the next is another bond. So I told you, lots of bonds. Uh, water projects is this one. Uh, if this looks familiar, it's because it's almost identical to one that was presented on the ballot about a decade ago. Uh, but as you know, we haven't um, lost the need for water. In fact, the last couple of years with our drought conditions, uh, we've had a growing discussion about how do we address ongoing water supply for a population that continues to expand. And the example that we see from Cape Town and South Africa just kind of adds to the activeness of the conversation. Um, so this one is about a $9 billion bond that would be publicly funded. So this would go onto the, the calendar for sale, and then you and I would be responsible for bond payments. This one has a slightly longer repayment uh, period of 40 years rather than the typical 30 or 35. Um, and there are a couple of different funds that are identified here. So it's not just rainwater collection. Some of it goes into uh, wastewater recycling. Some of it goes into habitat reclamation. Uh, and part of that, um, there, there are rivers, and especially in Northern California where there's been invasive 
massive weeds and grasses growing in that are choking off the water supply, that are starving different fisheries, and so they're trying to add some of that um, maintenance work into this particular bond measure. Um, there are some uh, dam repairs identified, so if you followed the story last year about the Oroville Dam almost breaking up in uh, Shasta County area, uh, that is identified as a, so uh, a target for repairs, although they are in conversation with the federal government to cover some of that. So there's language in the bond that says those monies would either be f uh, foregone or redirected if federal funds replace the need for state bonds. Um, so there's a variety of different water-related projects, again, very similar to what we saw a few years ago, um, just in an expanded format. I think the last bond measure was around $4 billion, and this almost doubles it. The total cost, in case you're wondering what this looks like over a 40-year period, it almost doubles the cost. So we have um, nine, close to $9 billion, and we'll add another $8.4 billion in interest over that 40-year period. In terms of pros and cons, um, most people view water supply as an essential service, and so this is seen as a way to maintain that over the long term. Um, there's ongoing concern about climate change, whether you believe it's man-made or natural. Nevertheless, we know that uh, rainfall was becoming at least cyclically um, uh, scarce, and therefore there needs to be proactive measures to try to address the long-term supply. That's on the yes side. The no side is critical of the fact that we don't have any major infrastructure identified to capture rainwater. There's no um, new dams proposed that would uh, uh, kind of reservoir, be a reservoir for future water use. Um, nevertheless, as you can see, there's no organized PAC or political action group here to oppose this particular measure, and it appears to have at least um, modest bipartisan support. Um, the next one is a bond. So this one is a hospital construction bond, and it allows the states to sell uh, a million, I'm sorry, billion and a half dollars in bonds to construct facilities or expand facilities that particularly serve children. So this is a children's hospital initiative only. It doesn't address adult patients, and so they've only identified hospitals that have a primary constituency of children. Um, interestingly, uh, most of the children's hospitals in California are nonprofit private hospitals. For those of you in healthcare, maybe this is not any new news, but for those who don't follow this closely, uh, we rely on our private partners, but as you know, um, capital, uh, funds to expand uh, infrastructure is, is challenging sometimes. There, you don't always have the ability to raise what you need up front. So this would allow uh, the state funds to be used to do that, in part because these hospitals uh, serve all Californians. And uh, their estimated patient load right now is two million a year. And uh, they take patients who are on Medicare and Medi-Cal, this is your low income health, uh, health insurance programs, all the way up to private praying and private insured patients. So these are all access facilities and the state uh, feels that uh, providing some additional infrastructure help will allow an expanded access. We know that you know, with medical inventions, medical treatments, um, diagnoses are more readily uh, available, but treatments are also more costly and sometimes can involve long-term care. In addition to the eight nonprofit private hospitals identified for this particular bond measure, and they would just split the funds equally, there are five University of California uh, managed hospitals that would also be recipients of funding. They come in at a lower amount, in part because they don't serve the same uh, number of patients as the nonprofit privates do. So the closest one to us is Loma Linda, also Children's Hospital of Los Angeles is on the list as well. And then there's a few dollars left over that they'll spread out to the remaining 150 hospitals that have a dedicated um, children's ward of some sort. So the total cost, this is over a 35-year period, is about $3 billion, just shy of $3 billion. In terms of pros and cons, um, again, the idea is that it provides some upfront capital uh, investment for uh, hospitals that provide a vital service. It, it helps them to expand patient care on a per patient cost. It represents about $40 a patient uh, over the life of, the, or sorry, the, for the annual repayment cycle. So when you think about that minimum payment we do each year, it's about 40 bucks a patient, and they think that's a good investment. 
On the no side, um, there's some interesting dialogue about whether this should have been presented to voters or if this is just a regular legislative bill. I don't know that that makes a difference now. It qualified for the ballot and you get to vote on it. So uh, for those of you who are political scientists, that might be an interesting thing to consider. Um, and there is some talk about the fact that nonprofit private institutions are receiving funding from taxpayers, um, but this is not unlike what we see in other uh, parts of the state where state uses and needs, relies on private uh, partners in order to accomplish the work of the state. So as um, APU benefits from occasional state grants, we're in that mix as well. Uh, and then there's no official committee position on this one either. So there tends to be pretty widespread bipartisan support. So we're out of bond territory now. We're moving on to the more exciting world of property taxes um, and Prop 13 considerations. So there are a few people, and if I can just quickly show, the camera doesn't need to record this, but how many of you were here in California when Prop 13 was passed? This is 1978. All right, okay, so you might remember a little bit of the conversation uh, about property taxes, and I thought it would be helpful just to give a quick overview for those who are new to the state or maybe were not quite fully politically cognizant in 1978 um, about some of the concerns that were presented. So if you think back to uh, the 1970s, we had double-digit inflation. This is the middle of the Carter administration. We had oil embargoes happening, and oil prices were on the rise, so energy was in short supply. Um, there was price pressure on every single front, and housing was just one in the mix. Voters, and this is a, 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 a Jarvis initiative, right? So you might remember the consumer advocate, Howard Jarvis. He got some uh, f uh, folks together who were concerned about pressure on, on citizens and taxpayers to continually cough up more money to meet the state's uh, seemingly never-ending coffers. And one of the things they pointed out was that property taxes seemed to impact the retired age population a little bit more dramatically. Because you could pay off your mortgage, but then you might have a year property tax bill that would continue to go up and up and up, and you'd have no additional income to cover an increased property tax bill. So unlike people who are out working and potentially have the ability to go make more money, retirees on a fixed income didn't have that ability. And so sometimes they would have their mortgage paid off, but unable to pay their property taxes, and therefore they would lose their home because they couldn't pay that tax bill. And uh, the thought was, you know, that's the last thing we want to see happen to folks on retired incomes. And and we want to make sure that people can stay in California throughout the duration of their life and not force them to leave. So Prop 13 put limits on property tax assessments to one, only 1.1% 1 .1 each year. So it set the valuation in 1978, and those who stayed in their home only had a 1.1% increase that was, at the time, much less than the cost of inflation. Today, it's less than the cost of inflation. So it would allow states and counties to continue to increase revenue, but at a much lower rate than what market demand or inflation would require. Uh, and that provided some income uh, protection and price protection for our seniors. Over the time, over time, what this has meant is that there's been uh, a disincentive to invest in housing. And so that was the piece that I pointed to earlier uh, around Prop 1, is that we don't have as many housing units constructed because the property tax revenue, once someone has moved into a property, can only go up less than the cost of current inflation. So when states and counties and municipalities are trying to determine how to zone land and whether to build a car lot, a retail car lot or a housing division, um, they often will err on the side of retail or sales tax generating uh, businesses because it provides immediate cash infusion into the county and city coffers to fund vital services. Um, so if you look, we've probably got more car lots than any other you know, state in the, in the country um, because we have a perverse tax incentive, if you will, that prioritizes sales and revenue generating retail establishments over some housing construction. So that's kind of my little tutorial on the pros and cons of Prop 13 is that there's some unintended consequences that I think this proposition is trying to address. Um, so what uh, is under Prop 13 
2014 originally is that seniors could move one time and maintain their current property tax rate. So 1.1% increase over time, your value of your home is going to increase quite a bit. Um, and if you purchase a new home, then the, the property tax time clock starts all over. So you start paying the, the percentage on the new valuation and then it goes only up 1.1% from there on out. And you get one time exception to move. This would lift that one time exception. Um, it would also remove the provision that you had to stay within the same county. That's the other piece of Prop 13 that would be removed with this particular proposition. Um, so some of it is in response to the fires and other disasters we've had of recent that people haven't been able to re build affordably in the community that they lost their home in, um, but there's been pressure to try to find something workable because Prop 13 uh, uh, incentives uh, would give them a huge tax benefit if they're able to rebuild in their home county. Uh, but sometimes people want to relocate to be closer to family or to maybe go to a less uh, urban area or perhaps in some cases a more urban area, and this would uh, theoretically give them an opportunity to move multiple times and not lose their entire property tax savings, if you will. Um, so if they bought a new house, there would be some additional tax revenue based on the new valuation that would come to counties and cities, but it wouldn't be the full uh, new valuation. So they would uh, retain or that would be grandfathered into the property tax calculation. So the uh, voter guide has a couple of different scenarios that said if you bought your home for 100,000 or 150 and then you sold it for 200, here's what your property tax would have been. And then if you bought a new home for 450 or 600,000, um, you would owe more tax, but you would subtract the old valuation from the new valuation and therefore um, reduce the amount that you as a new homeowner in that community would have to pay. Um, there's a potential, un I mean, it's unknown because we don't know how many people would move or how often they would move. There's an unknown fiscal effect for counties, but property tax is where counties and cities get the majority of their money. So the state gets it from your personal income tax, counties and cities get it from sales tax and property tax. So anything that affects those two pieces would mean your county services and your municipal services might be affected. So you're gonna see that show up in the viewpoints on both for and against. Um, uh, the, on the four side, it allows for some more freedom, some more flexibility and moving. It maintains the Prop 13 spirit of trying to protect uh, homeowners as they enter their uh, retirement or pre-retirement years. So this proposition would still affect only those who are 55 and above or seriously disabled and probably um, qualifying for different uh, state and federal programs. Um, and it also allows um, people to change their home size. So sometimes you might have elderly folks who are in a home that's too big or it has stairs and they want to move, uh, but they're fearful of losing their Prop 13 benefit because if they buy a new home, even if it's a moderately priced home, uh, it, depending on how long they were in their original home, it could still be quite a sticker shock on the property tax. And so this would allow a little bit more flexibility and freedom, especially um, by limiting the county restriction too. In Southern California, there's like four major counties, so we don't really worry about it too much. If you're in Northern California, where uh, more than half of the counties are, some of those counties are really small and you don't have to go very far to be in a new county. So that may be uh, some of the thinking behind this as well. Um, in terms of the opposition, um, this is not a, what we call a means-tested benefit. So people who are on all sides of the income scale would qualify. So when we often think about retirees, we're thinking about pensioners or people on Social Security only, but that's not what this proposition would limit um, the audience to. Potentially, it could uh, you know, apply to anyone, no matter how wealthy or, or, or poor they are. Uh, and so there's no um, income considerations there. So that is potential loophole for abuse that some have pointed out. It could also then, again, uh, we don't know how much, but it could reduce the amount of funding available for municipal services, including public education and fire and paramedic and police services, um, other essential county services. Um, and again, it could have a perverse incentive on home construction. If new homes are sold to someone that carries that Prop 13 property tax benefit with them, that means there's not going to be as many, uh, as much property tax revenue from that new home construction, and it might um, incentivize counties and cities to invest that property in other types of revenue generating enterprises like a car lot.
Uh, Prop 16, or sorry, Prop 6 uh, is, a, uh, I've titled it Repeal of Fuel Tax. That's not the official title because it was very long, and some of these I've just shortened for brevity's sake. Uh, this one, though, note is a constitutional amendment, and that means that um, it changes not only the policy identified here, but also how future changes are to occur. So in 2017, the state legislature voted, uh, this was Senate Bill 1, to increase fuel taxes in order to fund infrastructure improvement projects related to uh, highways and bridges and other car-related activities. Um, so for those of you who are, you know, consumers and you're curious, it increased the gas base tax by 12 cents a gallon. So it went from 18 cents a gallon to 30 cents a gallon. And there's an excise tax that's added on to that. Uh, and that's now, it was variable in the past and it ranged everywhere from nine cents to 20 cents a gallon. Now it's fixed at 17 cents a gallon. And then for those who are diesel consumers, truck drivers, and I don't know how many diesel cars are out there, but there might be a few. Uh, it's now the sales tax and um, fuel tax is fixed as well. So 36 cents a gallon uh, sales or excise tax uh, increased by 4% to 5.75%. Um, I don't know if this has hit anyone's uh, car registration bill yet, but there's also a new vehicle fee. So in addition to your license fee that you get to have the privilege of putting your sticker on every year if you pay that bill, there's also a new vehicle fee that uh, is required to re-register your car every year. And that ranges based upon the value of your car from $25 to $175, and that would be an annual fee added to your license fee. Um, and then for those who have a zero emission vehicle, there's a flat $100 fee that is also added to your license fee. It's in lieu of, so it's one or the other. You get, you get the, you know, you don't get an option they choose for you. Um, that hasn't hit yet because that was delayed until 2020, probably to continue incentivize people to buy zero emission vehicles. Um, this, because it's a constitutional amendment change in how we do process, would require the legislature to come back to voters anytime they want to raise the fuel tax in the future. Um, and part of the concern driving this, this is where parties have started to pick sides on these issues. This is an a, a, a initiative that was sponsored by, with support of the Republican Party. In part, they felt shut out with our Democratic um, supermajority in the legislature. They raised a lot of opposition at the time this bill was introduced, but because they don't have the numbers in the legislature to stop, stall, or modify the, the law, um, they, they were shut out of the process. And so this mechanism would allow voters at least the input that right now isn't reflected in the traditional party system within our state legislature. So now that's a, a proposed solution. The yes and no's, um, some of this says, uh, you know, has to do with the, the um, you know, who gets to say what uh, in terms of policy. So you get that, that this is, should be a legislative vote, that two thirds supermajority is plenty sufficient to take into account the range of voter concerns on this particular initiative. Um, um, that's on the no side, on the yes side. This is people saying we should repeal the tax and change the process. They're saying it's not sufficient. Um, those in favor of the yes side to repeal the tax also say that when you remove the $5 billion that are identified by this rate hike, that still remains $30 billion a year for infrastructure improvements, which they, there haven't been any new construction projects started in a while, so they believe that that's sufficient to repair the existing bridges and roadways. Um, and then for those on the no side, again, they want this to be a legislative issue, um, that uh, they're concerned that it's not going to provide enough funding if we repeal this particular tax and ask voters to go back and approve every single tax increase in the future, and that would result in either halts to current projects, um, renovation projects underway, or would delay the start of new improvement projects. Um, Prop 7, Daylight Savings Time. So I'm going to simplify this uh, because I looked at the voter guide and it got into a lot of speculative territory very fast. Um, so a lot of the pro and con arguments and description of daylight savings had to do with whether we should keep daylight savings or whether we should abandon it or stay on it year round or none of that's on the table. So I, that was just, that's all red herring stuff. That's not what we're actually voting on. The only thing we're voting on here is who gets to make that decision in the future. In 1949, voters passed an initiative that said voters are the ones to make that decision, whether to stay on daylight savings time or go back to 
to standard time. Um, voters and, and legislators um, have gone back and forth on who's the appropriate venue to ask these things. Uh, but 1949, voters said, we want to be in charge on this. Uh, this is reversing that. So if this passes, the legislature would be the one to debate the pros and the cons of daylight savings time. It wouldn't be up to the voters any longer. Um, right now, though, we're limited in that the federal government hasn't given permission for any changes. So that's the other curious thing about some of the argumentation coming through is it's all, again, speculative. If the federal government allows it, what do we want to do? Well, that's not in process. It's not an agenda item. Uh, Congress can't, and this is my one aside for the night, Congress can't vote on anything these days. So I don't anticipate that this is going to be a hot button issue any day soon. Um, and it just basically uh, al allows for language that complies with federal law. Um, so it's up to you. Do you want to uh, continue to have control or give it to the legislature? That's basically the heart of this particular initiative. Um, one kind of aside there on terms of the process, uh, right now the federal government does give exemptions for people who want to skip daylight saving time altogether. So for those of you who come from Arizona or you have family in Hawaii, uh, they have made that option. Everyone else has agreed to follow federal law on the daylight savings time. So we're going to be soon changing our clocks again because it's, I think, the first Sunday in November now. Um, and as long as federal law is, is in effect that doesn't give us an option to do anything else other than go back to standard time, those are our choices. Um, so yes and no is just really around, I, I skipped the, is daylight savings a good, good idea or not? That's not on the table. It really isn't. At some point it might be. And then we can have all those discussions about whether we want kids to go to school in the dark or whether we want to save electricity bills by having sunlight later on. That's not an option right now. So really this is simply who should vote on this. A yes vote says let's let the legislature vote. A no vote says let's keep the voters voting on this particular issue. In both cases there's language that says we will continue to comply with federal law. Okay, I'm going to move forward in the sake of time because we have two ones that I know are hitting the airwaves really um, in, in a large amount. The first one is uh, Prop 8, cap on dialysis center fees. Um, so in the state of California, we rely a lot on private clinics to do dialysis treatment for chronic patients because it is a little bit more flexible, it can adapt to patient demands, um, and it's considered to be a more um, sustainable option to have private providers come in and do this. This particular initiative would propose a, a cap on fees that the private providers could charge to 115 percent. Um, and so the, the, the assumption is that anything beyond that that doesn't directly relate to patient care or um, health care improvements for the infrastructure would be refunded back to the patient or back to the insurance provider. Uh, for those of you who are working with grants or working with administrative structures, another way to think about this is that this bill or proposition would limit the indirect cost for uh, chronic dialysis centers to just 15%. Um, and so for many institutions like APU and other universities, the typical indirect cost that allows for us to pay for property um, taxes and, and uh, utilities and uh, sewage and, and water and all of the infrastructural costs as well as some administrative overhead is usually between 35 and 45 percent. So the reason why this ad is attracting or this proposition attracting a lot of ad time is because it would be a dramatic change in how nonprofit private institutions would work around the chronic care for diabetes dialysis patients. It would limit that overhead to just 15%, which is a substantial reduction off what they currently charge, uh, which they haven't publicized, but given other nonprofits, my guess is it's probably closer to 35 to 40%. Um, the Public Health Department in California would be uh, authorized to determine what's allowable or what's related to patient care, and um, anything above that designation would be refunded back to the insured patient or the patient directly. This does not affect Medicare patients. That's separately negotiated, and they have a whole different cost structure. So for those on Medicare, it wouldn't have an impact at all. The pros and cons. So uh, the yes vote says that this would really reduce administrative bloat and overhead and redirect dollars back to patient care, which is where they believe the emphasis should be all along. Um, they cite some, some um, uh, variable conditions in patient care, and they believe that having an overhead cap will provide 
uh, some, some continuity and some consistency in that. Uh, and again, everything else would be either refunded or confiscated by the state through various fees. Um, on the no side, there's a concern that this is going to be so un profitable that the private centers would go out of business, uh, that they simply need more than 15% in order to maintain operations, and that there would be no longer any incentive for them to try to do this. Uh, the other option, I guess, they're saying would be to inflate patient care costs and try to hide some of the administrative overhead um, by inflating costs to insurers or patients directly, which they don't think is wise either. Um, and then the last little point, which is not in your official booklet, but if you go to a couple of other sources, that identify funders behind each mechanism. Some have pointed out that the only supporter on the yes side is the union service employees group um, who have a, a grudge with a couple of the major providers because they refuse to allow workers to unionize. So you can draw your own conclusions there. there that is uh, verified with the financial reporting campaign donations that um, all of the yes uh, side is being supported by the SEIU. Um, and so you can see a lot of the healthcare providers are concerned about the loss of care, and that may or may not impact your, your thoughts on this one. Say to some of these facilities, because I've heard advertisements about, you know, the facilities are dirty, mm -hmm. and, you know, is it like an administrative oversight mm -hmm. to this so that the uh, facilities are clean and... Yeah. I you think know, it, in I good think condition. The, the, it, it, the argument that the yes side is making is that um, there is more um, focus on profit and less on patient care. And so by reducing the profit overhead that's allowed to just 15%, uh, you would incentivize centers to instead use those fees to support better conditions or better um, conditions for, or uh, better environmental um, surroundings for patients. Um, and yeah, I, I think that's, that's the argument that you're seeing play out in the ad time, is that by capping that profit, you would redirect some of the resources back to patient care. Just a comment. I found it interesting that the major no vote, which is splattered all over the media today and it's spending millions, is pretty much funded by DaVita, which is one of the largest dialysis providers in the absolutely, state. Absolutely, absolutely. So yeah, they have obviously an incentive to see this defeated. Um, the no vote has a number of identified PACs. They are certainly the largest contributor to that. Uh, I think right now the fundraising is um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 12 to 1 in terms of the ratio. So DaVita is the, the largest contributor to that, and of course they're the largest provider. So they have an incentive to stay in business. So the other hot one right now is the rent control initiative, uh, Prop 10. So this, this one is a hard one because there are some uh, compelling arguments that you're seeing played out in the ads. Basically what this does is it repeals a state law that limits rent control uh, that cities and counties can currently operate. So 20% of Californians do re live in rent control conditions. Uh, that doesn't include Azusa, um, but it does include Santa Monica and parts of San Francisco and other high rent areas, uh, and this has been in existence for a while. The state had put this place uh, in place, um, it's been in place for a long time, uh, back uh, before 1995, because they wanted to incentivize new housing construction, and they thought that if there was a um, a cap on rents, that, especially around apartment housing or multifamily dwellings, that uh, developers wouldn't want to invest because they couldn't recover as much as they would like on profits. And uh, since 19, you know, the early 1990s, we've had this statewide initiative that says you can't um, impose rent control without the state's permission. So this would lift that um, and would allow local control over uh, rents everywhere in the state. So. City of Glendora, City of Azusa, City of Claremont, they could get together and decide they want to adopt rent control. Now, the, other, the thing to keep in mind is that the unintended consequences are really unknown. I don't know that if states uh, give local governments the capacity to do that, that they will actually do that. Uh, because when you're, rent, you're uh, limiting rents, you're also limiting uh, property tax revenue because the valuation of that building or that home all of a sudden becomes less profitable and that's gonna impact uh, decreased property tax values. And income tax uh, for the state will also diminish, which will put increasing pressure on state uh, to turn over to county and cities for making up the revenue gap. So I don't know that that would happen, uh, but certainly that's uh, something to consider because it does directly have a fiscal effect 
of an unknown dimension on revenue. The other thing that is showing up in the ads is that previously it only applied, the state law only allowed rent control on multifamily dwellings, so apartment complexes, condo complexes. This would potentially allow it for any type of housing unit, including single family homes. Um, so that again would be determined by local governments just because they have the authority doesn't mean it's an automatic yes they would do that. So the conversation then would shift back to the local level. So I think sometimes these ads forget that just because it's allowed doesn't mean it's going to happen. Um, this will be a conversation that every city council would have with their residents about whether they want to adopt rent control measures if this were to pass. So on the yes side, um, for those who have a strong inclination towards local government, feeling that local control is where residents have the most impact, uh, that's showing up in the yes arguments because it would mean the conversation shifts out of Sacramento into Azusa, into Glendora, into Covina, where people have a vested interest in um, not only rent control but also property valuation. Um, it would also give uh, cities on the yes side a little bit more flexibility to address homelessness and housing crises uh, because sometimes that can spring up and they don't have a lot of mechanisms to address that directly. So having some rent control capacity could potentially be a tool in their toolbox. And then additionally, um, they would be able to uh, potentially offset some of the growing homelessness population and maybe redirect some dollars that normally go towards landlords and higher rent if you free up some consumer spending, they might actually go buy a new car at that fancy car lot down the street. So there's some uh, potential spillover effects that they're identifying here as well. On the no side, um, there's concern that if, if this sh conversation shifts to every single city council, that we're going to be spending a lot of time, energy, and money um, developing rent control policies and administering rent control policies, or if nothing else, debating rent control policies. Uh, there's something like four, or 590 different municipal governments in California that could potentially have this conversation, um, and again, would have some tax implications of an unknown dimension. It could be minimal. It could be great. We don't know because it hasn't ever been tried. Um, we also, and I, this is not in your official bulletins or any of the ads that I've seen particularly, but it's, I'm picking this up from conversations we've seen in places like New York. Um, there's, there's concern that if you don't incentivize um, higher rents, then landlords become slumlords and that they won't spend the money they need to keep up with upkeep and utilities and, and keep the building in, or house in good working order because there's just not the same profit incentive as, um, as they may have had in the past. One final thing I forgot to mention on the yes side, um, I do know from my criminal justice research that one of the causes of crime is uh, a transient population, or at least that's a variable that's often attributed. So some blame high rent, so people come and go on a regular basis because they get evicted and they have to move somewhere else and it becomes a cycle and kids get pulled out of school and it becomes um, a, a source of housing instability that can impact uh, particularly at-risk youth. So there's some research that you might want to consider there. Uh, so just to clarify, would this proposition uh, be transferring the authority of the state government to determine this and give it to the local government, or would it just be giving this to the local governments um, as a power that neither the state nor the local governments had before? It used to be a power that belonged to local governments to set and zone um, housing in a way that aligns with their communities. The state took that away uh, in the early 1990s, and so this would be restoring some of that local government control. Um, or another way of saying, local governments don't have a constitutional right to exist in and of themselves. They only exist by approval of the state. So the state has said as a condition of their approval, you have to buy, abide by certain policies. And this is now a restriction that would be removed if the proposition were to be passed. But you're right, it's just a transfer of power over who gets to make that decision. Right now it's in Sacramento. If this were to pass, it would happen at the city level. How far would the reach be? Would, if, for example, if somebody had a B&B, &B, could they determine what they could charge for? Um, I don't know yet. So the, the vacation rental implications are not covered in here directly. I don't think that your home B&B &B or Airbnb rental property would be impacted uh, in terms of the rates there. This is really long-term housing uh, that is covered by traditional rent control policies. So the short-term rental rates would, would not be directly impacted, at least from anything I've seen in the statute. I'm calling this farm animal housing. It's not exactly the official title. 
Uh, but you might remember, if you've been around in California for a while, in 2008, we had a proposition that required um, certain conditions for animals that are slaughtered or uh, produce some element of food for people in the state. So this is where the cage-free egg uh, chicken movement began, and we're seeing it continued here today. Uh, so in 2008, the language uh, was pretty vague. I guess it could vary by animal size or type, but here's what the proposition said, um, that they had to have spaces where they could turn around freely, lie down, stand up, and fully extend their limbs. That applied to uh, egg-laying hens, um, breeding pigs, so mama pigs who are having piglets, and also veal calves. Those are the, the three animals affected. Um, but as you can imagine, there was a lot of variables that went into the calculation, and so this is proposing more um, uniform language about how to calculate housing requirements for farm animals. Uh, so now they get a square footage allocation. So for your uh, cage-free egg-laying hens, right by 2020, they get a square foot of personal space. Uh, by 2022, they will have, uh, they should have access to an enclosure where they can walk around freely, um, and the equivalent of that space should be one to one and a half square feet feet per hen. So if you've got 10 hens, they need 10 square feet and the ability to move in and out of uh, different compartments at will. Uh, for breeding pigs, they need 24 square feet of space. And for some of our students who are probably living in a small dorm room, you might uh, appreciate the comparisons here to a veal calf, which have now 43 square feet of floor space, uh, if in this proposition actually passes. Um, so this is just specifying some language that was vague to begin with. And then in addition to uh, specifying that, it also bans the sale of meat from suppliers who don't comply, where before it just said um, the state could take action. And so this is specifying what that action looks like. So the yeses and nos, um, they're expanding the definition of cruelty-free housing for farm animals. That's on the yes side. Uh, they want to make sure that our animals are treated well before they're slaughtered. Uh, so you can interpret the irony there as you see fit. Um, and it authorizes the Department of Health in the state of California to take corrective action or to take um, punitive action if it's not met. Uh, the no vote, um, there's obviously a coalition of interest groups probably around the suppliers of the food that are identified here um, that take issue with the square footage requirements and really talk about the, the increased food cost to consumers because as the um, housing for animals becomes more luxurious, that's going to require more space and time and maintenance and those costs are passed on to you and I. Uh, another little interesting you know, government aside, they're also saying this is a legislature vote, not a voter one. I'm guessing they view that voters are more prone to sympathy on these issues, uh, and they may have a more active uh, time lobbying legislators. That's my own personal guess on why they would take issue here. Uh, nevertheless, um, you have uh, kind of standard arguments against. So e Prop 11 was the EMT labor exemption law. Again, I'm summarizing the title, title a little bit more succinctly. This uh, proposition only applies to private ambulance care workers. So 75% of ambulance care uh, providers are private that contract with city and county governments. Uh, it's a more cost-efficient way to provide emergency care than to have every firehouse equipped with their own ambulance. It just becomes very prohibitive, especially when you factor in employee pension costs that are currently plaguing municipal governments at the, time, at the present time. Uh, so private providers provide most of the ambulance care coverage, uh, but right now there's a dispute over employment law. So in the past, operationally, um, ambulance drivers and EMT paramedics were required to stay on duty even during their uh, state authorized meal and rest breaks. Because of that, and they weren't, they weren't uh, complying with regular employee law, as you all know, you get 30 minutes for an unpaid meal break and then 10 minute rest period after every four hours of work. Uh, they weren't complying with that and so there was a major lawsuit, there was a class action in nature, and the state of California said that uh, we were out of compliance, or ambulance care providers were out of compliance, and that they were on the hook for fees and penalties and back wages and all sorts of uh, financial ramifications. So this proposition would create an exemption then to that particular piece of employment law, 
Um, and it basically allows EMT personnel to take their breaks as scheduled, and they're pretty particular. You can't have in the first hour, you can't have in the hour that you clock out. It's got to be regularly spaced. It has to be a true meal break. These would be paid, though, and as a, a, as a, a requirement, people would have to stay on call. Uh, and that allows um, um, uh, response times to be maintained. Um, the, the concern was if people turned off their radios and truly went off call or off duty and there was an emergency, we'd have to have a backup unit there to provide services and cover meal breaks and, and rest breaks and it would get very costly very quickly. And that cost would be paid to, uh, basically by county and state, uh, sorry, county and city governments who contract with those providers. Um, so the other piece too is that retroactively remo removes the fines for noncompliance. So the lawsuit that was determined a couple of years ago uh, it would address the fee structure that way. I'm assuming that will also be challenged in court, but at least the law is going to try to retroactively remove that. Um, and it also tacks on a requirement that says uh, ambulance care and EMT personnel have to have access to employer-provided training, especially around mental health. I think we've noticed that there's a PTSD issue and recurring stress, mental health stress, among people who show up at scenes of accidents and um, you know, cases where people are in, in bad shape. And so that uh, is supposed to address their, their kind of overall working conditions. So the yes side uh, says that this would put private EMT providers in the same category as public ones. So firefighters, police officers, they also operate under exemption from current California employment law. They can take their breaks, but they're on call the whole time they're on duty or on shift. And so this would put them in the same category um, that these meal breaks, if they're on duty, they're getting paid. So the, the trade-off before was a half hour unpaid. This is an hour that's paid. Um, the proviso though is that you keep your radio on and you respond to calls and if you are interrupted in your meal break because you're responding to a call then you have the option of rescheduling that meal break again with payment um, and that way the 911 response times which a lot of us come to depend on would be maintained we wouldn't have to wait for someone to come back from their lunch break in order to get the appropriate care. On the no side, there's a concern that this is gouging of employees, um, that this is taking advantage of them, they're not giving them the, the true break that they deserve, um, and it, it's, you know, really the motivation is to maximize corporate profits because it would be costly to replace them or have backup personnel on duty, um, but those are the only arguments identified, at least in print and among the packs so far. And again, this is one where there wasn't a lot of registered opposition, but those are the arguments that were made. Are there uh, statistics out there supporting the argument for, uh, meaning, you know, do we know if this is really a problem that needs to be addressed? Um, we don't know because we've always been out of compliance, so we haven't had long lag times and 911 responses uh, to justify this particular measure. They have calculated the replacement cost, so it would require 25% more personnel to be on duty to break all of the various units every so often, uh, and that inflated cost then would be passed on to local governments who contract with those companies for services. So they can calculate the fiscal impact, which is not trivial, but in terms of what that would do to 911 on response times, my guess is that they, we, we would, um, as a citizenry, prefer to pay more in order to maintain those response times rather than say, it's okay if you know, EMT doesn't show up for a half hour, uh, I'd rather pay a cheaper fee. That doesn't seem to usually be an option. Um, so we haven't experimented with that because the public outcry would be so great, but we have tried to calculate the impact from a financial perspective. There's a final for more information. Um, so some of this is available, of course, in your information guide that I've just summarized. Another source is ballotpedia.org, and that really dives into the financial support and opposition. So if you're curious about who's ponying up money for these measures, you can get a deep dive there. And then uh, League of Cal California League of uh, Women's Voters always puts together an easy, easy voter guide. So if you have new voters that you think would benefit from that, you can download their copy, and they have it in a variety of languages as well. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. It's always fun to see you. Thank you. Thank you.